Pollinators. Today we're actually going to talk about um, some of the relationships between insects and plants and that can be pretty complicated. Uh, much more complicated than most people think because most of us when we think of bugs on our plants in the garden, what do we generally, what comes to mind? Pants. Usually two things. Pests. Bugs that are eating my plants, pests, and then the honeybee. <clears throat> now honeybees are really cool, but honeybees are also an introduced agricultural animal. Not unlike chickens or goats or pigs or horses, they come from the old world. They are not native to the Americas. So today we're going to really focus on plants and insects that are native to this area. And then also plants that, although may not be native, also serve as surrogates in that they are nectar sources for native insects. So really when we look at um, things we can do in the garden to maximize pollinators, to maximize the beneficial insects, we're really talking about biodiversity. And with that, it's a tolerance of a lot of different things because nature isn't linear. Nature is really this complex, reticulated, multidimensional, that all the layers need to be there in order for the system to work and be healthy. And really a healthy garden is a garden that is rich in biodiversity, not just flowers, but everything that's associated with them. So we'll start out with a quick little walk here and look at some of the insects that are on this plant. And um, you'll see that we've got some butterflies and there's the cabbage white in the back. Cabbage white, the larvae feed on cabbage. That is also another insect that is what we call naturalized, meaning that they're now part of our ecosystem, part of our fauna. But being that it feeds on cabbage, where do you think it originally comes from? That's the white butterfly right here. Anybody want to take a guess? Eurasia, that's correct. So it's actually an old world species that's really well established. Doesn't really seem to displace or cause any real problems unless you're growing cabbage. Um, we also have some skippers and, and of these. These are these small butterflies that many people think of as moths because they're brown. And really with butterflies and moths, um, we have a set of characters that we use to distinguish, but those sets of characters really don't represent true biological relationships because essentially butterflies are really a group of moths. So they're oftentimes more closely related to some moths than they are to other than moths are to other moths. So I'm not going to make much of a distinction with that, but with the skippers, they are actually a butterfly. And um, oftentimes people mistake them for moths. And there's an example of one right there. But when it comes to pollination, Plants produce nectar. Nectar is a sugar food source for many insects. Plants being stationary organisms really depend on a couple of things in order to ensure their reproductive success. They either reproduce asexually by vegetating or selfing seeds that are basically genetic copies of themselves, or they're able to self-pollinate within a closed system, wind pollinated like a lot of our trees. These are the plants that really affect our allergies. You know, when we think of spring and fall, hay fever and allergies, those are oftentimes your wind pollinated. When a plant has really big showy flowers, the pollen is too heavy really for wind pollination. The showy flowers are to attract insect attention. Insects see colors of light that we don't. They can see into the ultraviolet. Some insects can even see lower frequency into the infrared, so they can see ranging from heat well into the ultraviolet. And flowers have evolved to basically attract insects, both in chemical and in appearance. We'll walk over here and take a few look, uh, look at a few others. And this is another heliotropium. I'm going to sit there and kind of turn the label here for you guys if you want to see. If you're curious about any of the plants that we are looking at and talking about today, most of our plants in the garden are labeled, so do feel free to look at the label, feel free to photograph the label, many of the plants we do offer in the nursery. This uh, heliotropium is a very good plant for attracting a lot of our native insects. And one of the things you may see, if everybody kind of moves in closely, <clears throat> you'll see these small bumblebees. Now bumblebees are one of the groups of bees, you know, how many of you have heard that pollinators are kind of imperiled, that pollinators are having problems? Um, and oftentimes the honeybees kind of use as our picture poster child of pollinators when in reality more of what we're losing and the things we're not seeing are the native insects. And bumblebees are among those that have really become increasingly rare. The one that you see here is the common one. It's um, Bombus impatiens and it's one of the few species that is still right, you know, quite common. Little guys here. Bumblebees form colonies. 
smaller colonies than honeybees. They do produce kind of a honey, a honey that's in a wax pot, very small nest. They often nest in old bird nests or rat nests, in, in uh, voids, under boards or tin, holes in the ground. So honeybee hives are not typically as evident. We're gonna walk around this way. Oh, this is a good one. A lot of plants in the aster family this time of year. There's things like ironweed, joe pie weed, goldenrods, asters. Those attract a lot of insects and a lot of our butterflies. The purpose that the plant attracts the insect is to ensure fertilization, which creates fertile seeds, which ensures a plant's future generations. With a loss in pollinators, what do you think are some of the other things that we are seeing decrease in population? Native wildflowers. If the plants aren't being fertilized by the native pollinators, then the plants aren't successfully producing as many seeds. So how many of you are familiar or aware of the fact that a lot of our native wildflowers are threatened or endangered? combination of habitat loss combined with the loss of the pollinators which also are taking a hit because of habitat loss as well as a lot of the pesticides we use. And of course as soon as we come around here unfortunately there aren't any large butterflies at the moment but there were earlier but you'll notice that a lot of the flowers that are in bloom this time of year are yellows or purples, reds, those oftentimes attract a lot of the insects that are more common this time of year. Over here on this table, we have set up a number of the plants that we sell in, the, in our greenhouses to the public. Many of these are natives or near natives. And these are excellent pollinator plants, excellent nectar sources for native insects. So if you're planting in your garden, you want to try to maximize biodiversity, which means that includes your species of plants, which the more species of plants that you plant, the more species of insects and animals you're going to have. How many people like to have uh, critters in the yard, things like the anoles, the tree frogs, the, well, it really all kind of works together. Um, one of the things I think is important too that a lot of people overlook in a pollinator garden or a nectar garden are host plants. And does anybody know the difference between a host plant and a nectar source? They eat the host plants. They eat the host plants. Host plants are essential for parts of the life cycle. Now the host plants oftentimes will have flowers that serve as nectar sources. But each species of butterfly or moth or insect actually are pretty specific to a plant or a group of plants. For instance, does anyone know what the monarch feeds on? Milkweed. milkweed. And there are many species of milkweeds and it will feed on most of them. This is an example of one of the milkweeds we sell. This one is um, a western species. It is Asclepius angustifolia sinoida. Monarchs love it. Here's some monarch caterpillars that we have taken from our garden. Um, we do find these quite often on the monarchs, I mean on the uh, the milkweeds that we plant, we find lots of monarch caterpillars, so I've got some examples. But here are some plants that really not only can be nectar or pollen sources to feed adult insects, they are also potential host plants for native insects. Um, even though snapdragons are Mediterranean, they're related to the, the plantago, which is a native host plant for the buckeye butterfly. I don't know if any of you know what that is. It's a really pretty butterfly, about two inches in wingspan, has big eye spots. They're kind of blue, it has some orange, really colorful, almost like a peacock, they're called peacock butterflies. Um, these are the caterpillars to the buckeye, and you're welcome to come over here and take a look. There are roughly a quarter of a million different species of butterflies and moths, each one, not only are the adults different, but the larvae are different. They are spiky, but they're actually quite soft. What look like spikes are really kind of rubbery little, it's almost like a, bit, like a little miniature dog chew toy. Um, black swallowtails, how many of you try to grow parsley? dill, fennel, the butterfly that decimates things like that, the parsley, the fennel, the dill, that's the black swallowtail. And there's a caterpillar to the black swallowtail right here. So you're welcome to come in here and take a look at some of the caterpillars that we have. But it's really important in our gardens that we learn to tolerate the caterpillars, especially if we want the butterflies and the moths. Most people want butterflies and moths and then don't understand why they don't have them when they either lack the host plants or they don't tolerate the caterpillars. So there's really nothing you can do to effectively control caterpillars without controlling butterflies. Because you realize it is a one becomes the other and one produces the other and it's a, it's a pretty integral life cycle that's, that's very tightly woven in with the plants. Um, we're going to take a quick walk and I'd like to kind of take us to the exit drive. We've got some really cool plants at the exit drive, really sunny. 
if you're interested little walk and we'll that usually has quite a few butterflies so we'll go take a look at that real quick when we talk about insects with, with ultraviolet vision especially butterflies the high frequency light mm -hmm. they can tell by looking at a flower whether the flower still has nectar or whether the flower is done and so oftentimes plants the flowers will begin to adjust color after they've been pollinated or after the nectar source after they've served their purpose the flower will, be, will begin to discolor the insects can actually see that discoloration before we do. 